All right. So yeah, I was uh, a little worried about getting here, but uh, you know, us JVM people arrived just in time. Oh. That, I'm sorry. That that was all. That was all Vijay's. Uh, <laughs> I, I claim nothing from that one. But the real Java people arrive at There you go. Oh, we are actually going to get into that as well. <laughs> all right. So. My name is Billy Crando. I am a developer advocate with this really small company called IBM. Anybody heard of IBM? A few, a couple? Okay, good. Yeah, I know, hopefully we're going to make it at some point. Uh, anyways, we're going to be talking about Eclipse OpenJ9, a lean, mean Java virtual machine. So uh, how many people have actually also heard of OpenJ9? Be, you know, good, good. Okay, there's a few, and a few more haven't. So obviously you're in the right presentation, and hopefully you're going to learn um, a whole lot during this presentation. So you can find me at Billy Crandall on Twitter, and you can also email me at William Crandall, William .crando at IBM.com. So my title, Developer Advocate, my point isn't necessarily only just to advocate you know, on behalf of IBM, but actually to be an advocate for developers towards IBM. So I absolutely do mean it when you say if you want to DM me or email me about any questions, it could be about OpenJ9 or anything about IBM, um, definitely let me know. I am very happy to hear your feedback or hear any questions. And we actually have some of the experts on OpenJ9 here today, much more than uh, I am. But uh, you know, I can always get, get connect you with like whoever might really be some of the experts at IBM on maybe the question you have or might be able to answer the question directly for you. So definitely, like I said, any questions about this presentation or anything about IBM, about IBM definitely feel free to reach out. If you find yourself with an intense desire to know more about OpenJ9, again, of course, you can reach out to me directly. But I've also done a couple, um, I've written a bit upon OpenJ9 and hopefully going to be writing some more on it. And you can find that at my website, um, billycrandall.com, category OpenJ9. And also the code for this presentation I'll be selling, um, you can find it also at uh, my GitHub repo, OpenJ9 batch processor. Go ahead. So, uh, uh, Tron Zug, you guys do also do a great job. It's great that uh, you take that first few five minutes to maybe kind of cover what's going on in the Java world. Actually, I help run the Kansas City Java user group, and that's actually something we've done as well because, you know, you obviously hear, everyone's here to kind of learn a bit about Java. Um, my team at uh, IBM, we also have a Java newsletter where we also kind of do this very similar. Uh, we release monthly, and we kind of just cover just broadly what's going on in the Java world. Uh, actually, I will be writing the newsletter for this upcoming month, and where I'm going to be talking about some of the new features coming up in Java 13. So if you're kind of interested just to kind of see what's going on in the Java world, uh, consider subscribing to our newsletter. Also, if you're interested either on the cloud or planning to get to the cloud, uh, definitely check out. We have some really great documentation at cloud.ibm.com. Um, slash doc slash Java, and whether you're Spring or Jakarta EE, Java EE, Micro Profile, um, we have some great documentation. Uh, of course, we're going to be using IBM Cloud as our implementation detail for how we're going to be demonstrating stuff, but a lot of the information is still good and useful no matter what cloud platform you might be on. So with that all the way, let's actually start getting into the real part of the presentation about OpenJ9. So why would you even be interested in switching JVMs from what you might have? So ideally, in the ideal world, demand would be static. It would be constant. You would just be able to set your capacity to exactly what your demand is, and things would never change. Of course, in the real world, this does not, um, isn't at all what demand looks like. The only constant about demand is that it's going to be constantly changing. It's going to be going up. It's going to be going down. So you're going to have to um, meet your capacity to that level of demand as closely as possible so that you're saving money. Because, and so over time, organizations have tried to get better about how they had tried to address this need for capacity. So way, you know, 10 plus years ago, um, and even still today, many organi some organizations were just running bare metal. They would go out and they would go buy servers and then they would have their own operations team would set up and manage them and they would run them. 
And so a big problem with that is that it's very uh, coarse grained. And it was also something you would have to really plan out ahead. So you would probably at every, you know, an annual meeting say like, okay, how much do we think we're going to go up in demand, you know, for the next year, go out and buy hardware for that. And if you're wrong, you didn't buy enough, then you're not maybe fulfilling all the customer needs you have. And if you buy too much, well, that's just waste of capacity. And so that's also the big problem with just running bare metal is it's very, very coarse grained that with this, you have your capacity, but everything above that black line of capacity is just wasted, um, wasted space, wasted capacity. You have the capacity available to you, but you have no demand to meet it, so you're just wasting a bunch of money um, either buying the hardware or electricity um, just to power it. So, of course, organizations kind of realize this, and over time they try to get better with this, and maybe one of the first things they, they tried to do, maybe, you know, again, about 10 years ago, was starting using virtual machines. And it wasn't just necessarily about capacity, but it's also about operational flexibility. Um, but, you know, things are a little bit better. You can kind of break it up into sm slightly smaller chunks, but also generally any place I've been with that were using virtual machines, spinning down and spinning up a virtual machine was a very costly and time-consuming process. So maybe this demand curve isn't necessarily like a real-time demand curve, like minute by minute, but it could be, you know, maybe over the summer, maybe you're not getting um, as much demand, so maybe you spin down some VMs during that time to maybe be used for testing purposes or for some other purpose. So virtual machines allowed us to be a little bit more flexible, but uh, not quite all the way there yet. So now today, you know, in the past few years, we now have a bunch of platforms that then can be able to spin up and spin down containers that are managed in the cloud. And Actually, now, maybe going farther into the future, we maybe have serverless, but, you know, we're getting very much more granular. But now, with cloud platforms, we're able to be extremely responsive with whatever the current demand is. As demand goes up, we can quickly spin up a bunch of new instances of whatever our services that are being hit. And then as the demand goes back down, well, we can spin down those instances within a timely matter if we're not, we no longer have the demand that really necessitates their being um, spun up. So, of course, the organizations were moving to the cloud because, as mentioned, ability to quickly respond to capacity, there's a reduced capital cost, and there's, well, yeah, maybe not necessarily reduced operational cost, but uh, a lot more operational flexibility that comes from running on the cloud than from particularly um, way back in the day of having to do bare metal. Now, new startups, you know, for just hundreds a month, hundreds of dollars a month, they can kind of set up their uh, new business, their new organization, and see how things go uh, without having to put down thousands of dollars in uh, equipment costs to have a site running and be able accessible by um, users. So the cloud gives us compute on demand. You know, you turn on a faucet and out comes compute. Now, I just want to point out that really, I spent probably about 40 hours working on this presentation, about 39 was actually spent on that animation there. So I just really hope you're appreciative of that, you know, very nice compute coming out of the faucet. It took a long time. No, so yeah, we can turn a faucet and out comes all of this computing capacity. But of course, cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, IBM Cloud, and so on. We're not doing this just out of sheer goodness of the heart. This is a business opportunity. So we are going to meter that usage. So when you're running your, uh, as you're running your cloud platform or running your services, there we go, um, out on uh, your cloud platform, we are metering that usage. So there is a very, very direct or very close relationship, uh, particularly with Java applications, between memory usage and, um, and cost. So really, when you're sitting in that max heap space on your application, that is going to have a very direct relationship to how much it costs your organization to run that application. Additionally, so there's also some other considerations when running in a cloud native environment, the ability to quickly spin up and spin down um, applications. So we also have to start to think about what does it look like as our uh, JVM starts up. And so in a traditional profile, 
we kind of have a slow uptake and maybe a bit of a bump in resource usage before it kind of maybe plateaus out. And then of course then throughput goes up with that. But it's important, you know, so we have a bit of a lag between when we start up a JVM and we start using all that memory and all that CPU usage and we can actually start really fully taking advantage of it. And then also we maybe have a bit of a peak in there that we kind of have to include, you know, within our container or however our JVM set up as well to kind of account for the additional a bit resource usage. And of course, that is all then waste as well. Now, it may not seem like a whole lot, but if you start spinning up and spinning down a bunch of JVMs, you have a bunch of instances running, well, that can start to maybe a bit add up. You know, going back to the faucet example, that leaky faucet, you know, a little drip, drip, drip over time, that actually does add up to be a pretty substantial cost over time or a pretty substantial waste of, uh, of water. So what are the demands of running in the cloud? So we need something that starts up fast. We're gonna be paying for that CPU, that compute resource usage. So we wanna be able to take full advantage as quick as possible. We also want something with minimal memory footprint because again, memory is gonna have a very close relationship with how much it's gonna be costing to run that application in, um, on our cloud platform. Minimal CPU usage, again, you know, if we're using a huge amount of CPU, that is gonna have a cost on our application and of course also a cost in performance or uh, throughput. Also, you know, small deployment size can be helpful. Being able to rapidly deploy and send stuff out there can help um, when at a cloud native mindset. Also, we wanna minimize resource usage when idle. Of course, you know, maybe you wanna spin down instances all together, but sometimes you may have a minimum number of instances you always want available. So we want those instances maybe using as little resources as possible, start maybe then allow those resources to be used by other instances or other services. All the same, that can be helpful for saving money. So ideally, a profile would look like this. It would rapidly start up. There wouldn't be much of, there wouldn't be any peak in resource usage, and then of course our throughput can, um, get uh, going just as quickly as well. So this is where uh, OpenJ9, Eclipse OpenJ9 comes in. So Eclipse OpenJ9, it was an open source project by uh, that IBM backs. It was created back in 2017. J9 goes back farther, but it was officially open sourced back in September of 2019. It's dual license under the Eclipse, the Eclipse Public License 2.0 and the Apache Public License 2.0. And you also totally feel free to contribute. You can check out um, the guide to contributing here at this bottom link. But what this really means though, for most people, is it's completely and totally and absolutely free to run OpenJ9, Eclipse OpenJ9 out in production. You never have to send IBM a penny if you do not, if you don't want to. That said, if you are a large organization of hundreds or billions of dollars in value, well, you know, maybe saving a little bit of money in operational costs isn't worth it. So IBM does offer support for all um, adopt OpenJDK runtimes, including OpenJ9. So I know that's important for many enterprises. I know that'd be important for many organizations I worked at before. So IBM does offer that. But again, that is entirely optional. And of course, OpenJ9, never any bugs. It's worked perfectly since it's been deployed, right? Yeah, so worked perfectly since deployed. No. So a little bit history in OpenJ9. So the first question I get all the time when I talk about OpenJ9 is OpenJ9 has absolutely no relation to Java 9. We talk about the name all the time. It's here for right now, but no relation to Java 9. So where does that name come from? So it is built off a small talk VM called K8. And so the developers of that VM back in the day were asked to write a new VM in Java 9. At the time, they felt that Java was a step back from Smalltalk as a language, but they felt like this new VM they were writing was going to be uh, a step forward. So J comes before K. I don't know, it also happens to be the start of the letter of Java, but then also there is 9, so it's a step forward. So that's where it comes from. At least that's the source. Uh, we have some of the experts, and I asked them, they seem to kind of agree with that's, that's what it is. So, you know. Uh, that, that's, that's the supposed story behind it. But, um, so Java 9, um, its background was actually running, sorry, mobile and embedded devices. It actually was um, built to run on Nokia, the Nokia 9300. 
Yeah, yeah. So way back in the day, I think it was about like 2002 when it was like running in that. 2001. So running on, what's the requirements of running in embedded in mobile devices, especially embedded in mobile devices back from late 90s, early 2000 time frame? Well, you need a fast startup. You're not going to want to waste battery and resource usage, you know, um, precious resource usage. Uh, starting up your application. So that's really important. Also, you want to have a responsive feel for the user. Minimal memory footprint. We're talking really resource constrained environments, so you can't just, you know, gobble up as much memory as is available, otherwise that's going to cause a lot of problems. Same with CPU usage. Again, same story. Minimal CPU usage because they're in a really memory constrained, resource constrained environment. Small storage footprint, same story. And of course, no resource usage when idle. Because particularly battery, when you talk about mobile, is really important. So once you start an application not, not really using it, you want to reuse as little resources as possible so you're not draining the battery. This sounds familiar, though, from something earlier. All right. Enough of me kind of just talking about this. Let me actually kind of show you this in action. So I put together a uh, demo to actually demonstrate this behavior. Um, and so what it is, is I just went out to uh, Docker Hub and brought down the baseline images, i.e. no JVM tuning, no in anything else, just went out to Docker and got the images of Hotspot Coretel, Graal VM, and OpenJ9. And then I put together an application, just a Spring Boot application. I didn't have anything really in mind about like trying to write this application to make you know, OpenJ9 look particularly good. But what I tried to do was try to keep everything as much in the JVM as possible. So like outside of reading in from the CVS file, um, everything's kind of happening in memory and you can kind of see what's happening here, reading in a bunch of records, then performing to some data transform, writing to an H2 database using JPA, doing some hashes, performing some checks, printing the console, just, just doing some stuff. Just doing a bunch of things, not just like doing some really simple like, oh, I can calculate, you know, the the volume of a cube, and you know, when we do that, OpenJ9 looks great. I'm trying to do something that at least on some level represents real applications actually running. So let's actually kind of see that in action. Really quickly though, just overall what this is going to be doing is I'm going to be running four concurrent um, Docker images, and it's going to be, like I mentioned, comparing Graal VM to Hotspot to OpenJ9 and uh, Amazon Coretto. And it's going to be looking at CPU, uh, container CPU usage, and container memory usage. Uh, unfortunately, Grafana and Docker, it's a bit coarse grained, but it still gives a really good overall indication as to the comp um, performance comparisons. All right, let me just go and kick off this demo again now that it's finally cleared out, because otherwise it gets like really sticky and it looks really crazy. So, Fortunately, uh, resolution may be a little bit difficult to see, but so OpenJ9 is orange, um, and then Graal VM is yellow, Hotspot is blue, and then Coretel is green. So we see here, it starts up with the application, and yeah, you can see Coretel, Hotspot, and Graal all kind of right up there, right around about 381 uh, megs of memory usage, while uh, OpenJ9 is actually right around half right now at about 191. Like I said, this isn't like a demo that I specially put together to make OpenJ9 look particularly great. Uh, this is really what we often see is about usually closer to 60%, and for some reason we're having a little bit of a spike there, but um, usually close to right around a 60% memory usage when compared to Hotspot. Um, in this case also we're running um, Java 8 um, for all of these. But really, that doesn't matter too much for OpenJ9. OpenJ9 has this a single code base that covers it all. Yeah, I'm not sure why that spike is happening. Of course, you know, sometimes that's the uh, danger and concern of running things um, in a live demo. That honestly does not often happen uh, with that. Yeah. No, but that, these spikes, that's, this is very unusual behavior. I'm not sure what's happening if maybe there's this kind of like a resource thread lock or something like that that's maybe causing like the GC to kind of not behave as it usually does. Um, it's when it's, your first huh? It's your first thought. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finally found it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but 
So what's nice though is we get about a 60% reduction in CPU usage. But as you see though, this is a batch process and it completed in about the same time as um, Pareto and Hotspot and Graal VM actually beat out Graal VM. Yeah, it's always a little bit different every time, but uh, Hotspot completed first at 101 seconds, uh, Coretto 104, and then Hotspot at 108. Uh, but that's what you're getting. You're not, uh, it's not like, oh, okay, we're way less, you know, 60%, uh, 50% memory usage, but then double the, um, uh, or ha half of the throughput is you're getting this huge reduction in memory usage. Um, while also maintaining near the same throughput. And what's also great is, is that in all these Docker images, it's the exact same Java binary that's running in all of them. It's not like, oh, okay, I had to rebuild these Java artifacts to run in OpenJ9, or I have to do like a limited data set in Java 9 or a limited feature set. It's the exact same Java binary running in all of these. Um, you're not gonna have to recompile or anything or redo anything. So this could be really great for doing things like A-B testing and production, saying like, hold on, this demo, there's clearly something up with this. Like if I actually run it with my code in production, it's gonna be completely different. Well, it's completely free to use. You can just drop one of your existing Java artifacts on it, you know, maybe just have one of your instances running OpenJ9, and then you can actually see, compare um, in real, um, real world terms, the performance of OpenJ9 to maybe whatever current JVM you're using. But anyways, that's just the baseline right out of the box performance you get from using OpenJ9, but of course we can maybe even do a little bit better. So there are ways you can tune a, um, OpenJ, um, OpenJ9 depending on what you're looking for. And also one thing to also kind of keep in mind when it comes to tuning, and tuning is it's not always necessarily just a single thing you're thinking about, about like throughput. You know, of course, yeah, throughput definitely is maybe one thing you're thinking about when you're tuning, but there's, again, resource usage. Maybe you wanna really save, have minimal uh, memory usage. You could also have startup. So maybe you're doing serverless, or maybe it's gonna have just some very short running instances. So maximizing or making um, startup as fast as possible would be a huge improvement. So there's a lot of different ways you can consider when it comes to tuning a JVM. So yeah, as mentioned, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so also with migrating JB, um, OpenJ9, so if you maybe DevOps or the DevOps people have a lot of experience doing command line arguments at the hotspot, well, hot, OpenJ9 does support a lot of them. Things like max memory or max heap space, um, minimal initial memory, and so on. Um, all those are supported by OpenJ9 and also do the same thing. And you can actually see all that support here of the command line migration at this link. Uh, but there's also a bunch of arguments, additional arguments as well. So we have some like cloud native arguments for cloud native JVM. So we have Xtune Virtualize. This is good tuning for running in containers. Um, enables VM idle management. And it also has some improved in startup and ramp up. There is a bit of a loss in throughput though, if you're using that. So it can be a bit weighed upon, you know, how much demand your service is gonna be having, how long running they're gonna be. If it's a very short running service, it makes no difference. If it's gonna be something much more long running, then, you know, again, that's, that's gonna be something you're gonna to have to weigh. Other things as well, quick start. Again, this is very much um, geared towards short lived um, task like function. So even as short lived as like that batch application was, you know, that ran in just about a minute and a half and change, um, you would notice a pretty significant difference in throughput in that if we were to put quick start on it. But like maybe if we were just instead of running 20,000 records, maybe 100 records or maybe a fewer than that, then maybe actually doing quick start to get that much more faster wrap up, ramp up and start up could actually be worth it in that scenario. Some additional tuning. Um, there's also using container support. This is actually enabled by default. This is actually kind of prevents uh, the JVM from looking actually the actual underlying system memory and then trying to use more memory than is actually available or that's allowed by the container. Um, you can also do things like tuning compacts on idle and tuning uh, GC on idle. And so pretty much what that does is it's kind of, you can think of it like hard disk defragging. Um, so by compacting it, it puts it into like uh, better um, pages on the heap and then the tuning DC on idle then kind of removes any 
empty pages on the heap. So it's just better uh, memory usage when uh, idle. I'm getting nods from the experts on that, so I have been explaining that correctly at all the other times I've been presenting on this, so that makes me happy. Uh, so also, so JVMs do a lot of repetitive report, a lot of repetitive work, rebuilding the same class files again, performing the same optimizations again, carry around their own JIT to do the above. Uh, so this is kind of maybe leading back to some of the original jokes about the doing things ahead of time. So in this office, we will not tolerate redundancy in this office, but no, on the cloud, we will not tolerate redundancy because we're paying for that in a very, very literal sense. We're paying for all that resource usage, so let's reduce that redundancy. So with OpenJ9, JVMs can work together. You know, the epic handshake from Predator, the best handshake ever. So, sharing class content. So, by default, this is what a class file looks like. It's, um, but this isn't a great way to share information um, because it's sharing both stateful and stateless information. So, in OpenJ9, we can split that apart into both the ROM class and the J9 RAM class. This is the read um, only part, and it's independent. You know, it's going to be having like class names, field names, and stuff like that. That's going to be the same for e every single instance of it. The RAM class, well, that's where we're going to be keeping the stateful information. So what this actually kind of looks like in practice is like we have a bunch of JVMs here. And so we have, you know, above like all their stateful information, but below we have all their stateless information. All this is identical. So instead of having every JVM go through and rebuild and do all that stuff, we can just share it across all those JVMs. So to do this, to enable this behavior, you have, you can just do X share classes to enable class sharing. And you can also kind of, there's a lot of modifications you can do around class sharing. Um, so by default, like the size of the cache can be up to 300 megabytes, or by default it's just 300 megabytes, but maybe you want something smaller. So for example here, I'm just saying the max size to 50 megabytes. 300 megabytes would definitely be more than enough than you should generally need for, in, but maybe like the largest of applications. Uh, but yeah, sharing class content, um, you can reduce startup and footprint by uh, roughly 20% or so. It's kind of the number I kind of hear from uh, the experts. Uh, also, so, and then how it kind of actually works within a Docker container. So, previous example, that would be kind of running on bare metal. Uh, but of course, when you're actually running in a Docker container, well, you're kind of, you know, you're in a container. So there's a couple of different ways of doing that, um, and I actually have an arc on that, but one is using a shared Docker volume, where you can just have a, your, all your different Docker containers having access to this volume that then shares all that class information in it. You know, that can work well. Um, another way of doing that, oops, I don't, um, do I think, yeah, create the Docker volume, yeah, I think I have it here next. Um, and then you mount that in, and then you just tell the, v the VM to store your class store information there. Uh, sorry, I, for and I forgot to add the slides here. But then another way is actually what's called uh, pre-warming a Docker uh, image. And so pretty much is when you're building your Docker image, you run your Java application. You know, maybe you do like some sort of like load test or something in it. For me, it was pretty simple in this example code. It's running a batch application, so it's kind of running through. It has its own load that I can just quickly create for it. Um, but yeah, when you're building it, you can just do that and then include that within your Docker image itself. And that way, every time that Docker image starts up, that class, shared class, is already there. Um, actually, one thing that we are currently working on is creating some Docker images that already have that shared class in there for really commonly used frameworks like, say, Open Liberty um, and others. And we're kind of working towards that. Hopefully, sometime later this year, we will have that out there and publicly available on Docker Hub, so where you don't even have to really worry nearly, nearly as much as about that. I don't actually have this um, uh, slide on this deck. But one thing I actually talk about in some of my other presentations is really the amount of code that we are actually writing, like the actual first party code that we're writing in our applications is really gonna be a very small portion of the actual code that we're running. Um, so really the actual, that we're getting out this shared class information for like these underlying frameworks and dependencies like Open Liberty, that's really gonna be covering most of your needs anyway, so you don't really even have to worry about that. I think Alistair, you said that, uh, 
Or how big is Open Liberty? Like how many lines is it? The, the given point is just five Yeah, five and a half. Yeah, that's right. Five and a half million. So, and does anybody have for any application anywhere near five and a half million lines of code for one single application, or just your entire organization? That was great. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. But that's just my point. No one else raised their hand, and you know, that's another framework. So that kind of goes to the point that. So the fact that we're going to have that out there means you're really not going to have to worry about you know doing this ahead of time. So like really, my, uh, my article is going to be assigned to the dustbin of history because it's not going to really matter too much anymore. So let's go into another demo. Um, just to kind of maybe show off some of these tuning specification or what it kind of actually looks like. So yeah, here we have a comparing some a tune OpenJ9. That's right. I did. I've been trying to finagle a little bit um, with these demos, uh, just to kind of see different kinds of tuning. So one, I just have, have like a standard tuning where I'm just doing like shared classes and Xtune virtualized. Um, another one has a startup tuned. Uh, another one's just the baseline comparison to them. And another one, I think it's like a resource tune. So I actually forgot that I did kind of make a lot of these changes to this demo. Um, so it's probably not doing the best job of that comparison. But. So we can see here. So initially, like this, um, the tune kind of did start with a little bit higher memory usage, but now it's a little bit under that. The resource tuned is using way less memory. I think it's going to kind of just run on forever, though, because I think I've just didn't give it nearly enough heap space to fully um, do everything it needs to do. But I was, one, I was just kind of experimenting with this. And I kind of apologize. I forgot I was doing this experiment um, just to kind of see the different ways you could tune it, just because, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, um, what it means to tune your application is going to kind of be different based upon the different needs. And I just kind of wanted to you know, push the boundaries on OpenJ9 in my not so great understanding of it at times. Um, so I actually kind of come at it from just a very much a Java developer perspective um, versus like someone who's been deep into the um, JVM performance my entire life. But yeah, we see the tuned um, finishes up before a baseline does. So it gives a little bit better throughput. Um, and we may well give a couple more seconds to see if the startup tuned and the resource tuned um, finish up faster or are able to finish up. But I, I do remember, I think the resource one kind of goes on forever uh, just because I just didn't give it the you know, proper setup to actually uh, complete. So, what were the parameters that were Let me actually go in. We can maybe actually look. Cool. Yeah. So, nine. Oh, great. I actually did have several of these. So, as I mentioned, um, like I said, we're using uh, Java 8, just the latest version of the OpenJ9 uh, Open available on. Uh, on Docker Hub. And so in this one, uh, this is what I was talking about when it came to pre-warming your Docker image or the uh, shared cache image. So when I'm building it, I'm running my, uh, um, my application, and I'm just telling it to do like a more concatenated version of the full batch process that can complete in about a minute. And then, yeah, uh, I'm then telling it to run, and I'm using shared classes. And in this case, like for example, I am doing read only. So it's not going to add any more to that uh, shared classes cache. And I'm also saying don't do any time set checks because like that's a way of maybe doing a little quicker verification on it um, so it can read from that shared classes image as well. Uh, for resource tune, let's see, what did I do here? For this one, um, I was trying to maybe work a little bit with some of uh, the other uh, uh, garbage collection policies. 
And also I set the uh, max memory usage to only 192 megabytes. It's still kind of the same um, behavior as far as it goes when it comes to the shared classes uh, behavior or usage. And then, yeah, uh, then I'm just, for this uh, startup tuned, I am just doing by uh, quick start as well. So that's about the only major thing. And then still using SIR classes. Does it really still use the SIR classes cast when it's in quick start mode, right? OK, sorry, I couldn't quite remember. <laughs> Exactly. That's that's all. That's doing. It's doing the AOT um, for layer usage. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's just some of the ways. And something I've been trying to experiment with. Sometimes the difficulty be of being a developer advocate. Like I talk on OpenJ9. I talk. In, I was doing a presentation earlier at our labs on automated testing. I talked in on IBM Cloud. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to focus and remember some of the things I've done on some of my other presentations. But. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways, though. And that's one of the things I was really trying to look at, though. It's just the different ways we can look at and change um, OpenJ9 to suit different um, use cases for tuning. Because it's, again, not always going to be a case where you just want to focus on throughput or resource usage. It may vary around with that. Oh, about 10 minutes? OK, I am going to quickly go through them. Um, so speaking of JITs and being just in time, um, one thing I do want to talk about, a little bit of a preview thing, is JIT as a service. And so, yeah, every JVM is carrying around its own JIT. And so instead of every JVM having to do that, we can set up a separate JVM that's just running as a service that does all this JIT compilation. So now all these JVMs can just be a little bit smaller. Um, it's about 40% less CPU seats, uh, fewer memory spikes from JIT optimizations. And also, you can more tune their container and so on for just the resource your application needs. You're not really having to worry as much about the JIT and compilation going on there. Um, these are the steps for enabling the JIT server. Um, and so, yeah. But it's um, still in development. I'm actually kind of working on demo of it myself because I actually really would like to show it off um, during these presentations. So additional reading. the. Um, OpenJ9 user docs um, can give some great reading. For a um, third party, you know, someone that's not with IBM kind of comparing JVMs, Chris who codes does some comparisons between the various JVMs. If you want to learn more about OpenJ9 class sharing, um, there's a really great um, article by Dan Hadinga, uh, who's another OpenJ9 developer um, there. And also there's an article I was mentioning earlier about using OpenJ9 within um, Docker. So I'll be happy to answer any questions now. You can, again, find me at Billy Crando. And then also a couple of our experts on OpenJ9 right here, ViJ Sunderson. Um, you can find him at uh, ViJSun at ca.ibm.com, at Mark Stooley. Um, also his email there. Please uh, go and check out OpenJ9 at adoptopenjdk.net. You can download it there. Um, the slides are available here at IBM Biz, OpenJ9, Lean Gene. JVM, and of course, again, the link to my code, uh, my GitHub repository. So, I'd be happy to answer any questions, or, or actually, any of us here have answer any questions. Thank you.